So GSK or glycogen, glycogen synthetase kinase 3 has been a, a target in kind of multiple diseases. Actually, it started a lot of uh, targets in the neurodegenerative space uh, with some drugs actually even making it at the time, but didn't really kind of proceed any further. And then subsequently, uh, based on a lot of preclinical data, we saw that GSK had multiple targets in, 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 this, in, this, in, in, can, in the cancer world in terms of uh, you know, modulating EMT, uh, the, uh, the, the immuno in the immunomodulation potential of the drug, uh, as well as it, its effects on apoptosis and f -kappa b So there were multifaceted uh, actions that were seen in the laboratories. And uh, the question is, how can we inhibit that? And, and some of the drugs that have actually got come into oncology, including the Lilly drug that was initially first to, first to, to trial, what, uh, that eventually stopped uh, 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 development because of troubles with in trying to inhibit the, uh, the target itself. And then l uh, that came up initially, it's called 9-ING-41, uh, then now with the name of l was able to actually, at least in preclinical models, we were able to see all the kind of multifaceted uh, targets of GSK-3 beta being inhibited, including NF-kappa-B, its effect on the EMT, its effect on fibrosis, and based on that, we thought that this is a, a good target for pancreatic cancer, just based on some of the kind of targets I just mentioned, and also the kind of the, 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 the fact that pancreatic cancer has very little options. So uh, when we ran the phase one trial, we kept our options open and we treated a broad number of patients. And what we found in the uh, phase one trial, uh, some of the, the, we saw a complete response in a patient with melanoma. And this would suggest when you see this in a melanoma, you wonder whether there's an immunomodulation mechanism of action. And we saw that in the laboratories as well. But as we developed the drug and combined it with chemotherapy, we felt that that would be the next step to do. And when we combined it with chemotherapy, we, we saw some effects when we, when we combined it with GEMNAP paclitaxel in patients who were already resistant to therapy. And another facet of this, this target is that it can reverse the resistance of chemotherapy. And we saw that in patients who were already refractory, we were able to reverse that with some clinical benefit in some patients with refractory pancreatic cancers. But I think to get the benefit in the immunomodulatory space, we need to bring that drug early Earlier because the immune effects are not appreciated for, la for a later uh, time point. So we ran the phase two single arm study and saw that signal and that justified our current randomized study. I think in terms of the primary endpoint, it's still a survival endpoint. So, you know, whether you do a one-year primary survi uh, overall survival versus a median overall survival, I think it's the same facet, right? And so when we calculated the power, we used the one-year uh, one overall survival rate as an improvement from the 35% uh, which was seen in the, uh, uh, the, uh, GEMNAP, the original GEMNAP paclitaxel uh, studies, and we wanted to get a 20% improvement. And so that was enough for us to have a power to kind of a reasonable uh, power of a study to be able to address both the questions and we did sensitivity analysis to account for any kind of uh, uh, kind of analysis we, we, we corrected it we corrected the alpha to uh, account for this and then now that the study is completed we, we, we obviously were able to show the median overall survival along with the primary overall survival both of them showing a kind of a, a statistically significant improvement over the standard of care at least in our patient population that we enrolled So we, so we, we experienced this uh, uh, when we were doing the phase one trials and we included a lot of ophthalmology evaluations in the phase one trials. And I can tell you that if you go back to the kind of uh, the normal regulatory functioning of GSK, we, we know that GSK regulates signaling in the photoreceptors in the cons and the rods and things like that. We never saw any structural damages in the retina. So what this actually we are seeing is a, a very transient visual disturbances, some patients call, call, will call it an annoyance, that is very mild and it's in keeping with post-infusion where the drug reaches what we call a C-max, a peak concentration, which is usually kind of in the, in the few hours after the infusion and then it would last typically anywhere from four to, to six hours and in most patients it typically resolves by 12 hours and the way a patient will describe it is I see a brightening or a darkening of the room 
and then I go to sleep that night after the treatment and I wake up the next day and it's everything's back to normal. Uh, so usually this is how they have often described it and patients are still able to go about doing things. Uh, perhaps we would tell them not to drive perhaps, that's in, in, especially if they are experiencing it. And we see this pretty much with every infusion and it's a class effect and we do not see any kind of long term damages uh, from that and we have done a lot of ophthalmology evaluations in the earlier patients that were on the studies. All right, so this is a new class of agent. No one has kind of seen this class of agents coming into the cancer space, right? So I think this itself is exciting. Uh, we haven't really seen a, a, a kind of a major leap in pancreatic cancer, you know, almost a decade. If you think about it, like the last, you know, the two regimens that we use in pancreatic cancer is fulforinox in 2011 and then gem in 2013. And anything that has happened after that is like a tweaking around of the chemo backbones. Uh, but we haven't had a no novel therapy come in and combined with, well with chemotherapy and safely as well. Uh, we have a couple of molecular targets which are only applicable to a very small subset of pancreatic patients. And so this is obviously giving us at least a renewed hope that perhaps this agent can do something. And as we moved it from the earlier trials into frontline, we are now starting to see the survival tales that the patients are, are, are staying on tr study longer and they're living longer. Uh, and so I think as we start thinking about how we do a kind of a registration trial, which is what our hopes would be, uh, we would be able to kind of, kind of try and recapitulate what we saw in a phase two trial in a larger phase three trial. And perhaps we can be a little bit more stringent uh, with the inclusion criteria because for this trial we were quite lax. We allowed, you know, community practices all around you as were involved in this study. Uh, you know, sometimes when you see a patient with pancreatic cancers, they are usually clinically symptomatic from their cancers. You know, are, are they the right candidate for the study or should we be a little bit more stringent? But this study, within the a randomized fashion, we have a control arm that behaved the same. And so even though the survival was lower compared to historical compost, this is our patient population that we enrolled and randomized in a two to one manner. So I think it's uh, promising and it holds a, a renewed hope, at least in pancreatic cancer.